Hi, um, Sarah Hindmarsh here from the Office of the Great Barrier Reef. I'm just checking in to see if everybody's on the line or you're on the line. Can anybody hear me? Okay, all right. Um, hi, my name's Sarah Highmarsh, as I said. Um, I'm from the Office of the Great Barrier Reef um, within the Department of Environment and Heritage Protection. I'm going to be giving the uh, webinar presentation today, which will hopefully last for about half an hour, which will give <coughs> us about half an hour to respond to questions and answers that uh, you will probably have on the regulatory impact statement. So before we get started, um, <clears throat> I'd just like to um, talk to you about a few housekeeping matters. So you will be muted um, for the duration of this presentation due to the number of participants we're expecting. However, <clears throat> you can ask questions by using the questions tab to type your questions, um, and this is located on the right-hand side of your GoToWebinar window. <clears throat> At the end of the presentation, we will answer your questions verbally um, where we can. Uh, we have a number of questions <clears throat> to answer, um, so if we can't answer them all in time, we'll endeavour to follow up and um, send you written responses. Um, any questions that are highly technical, um, we'll take them on notice and again, um, we'll provide a written response to you. So we are um, <clears throat> recording the webinar and we will make this available to all participants. If you are having problems with the software or you know others are having problems, um, can you please contact your local IT provider in the first instance? And you're welcome to provide feedback um, by emailing officeofthegbr at ehp.qld.gov.au. Okay, so I'll start the presentation. Okay, in terms of the overall presentation, these are the areas that um, I'm going to touch on. So why is um, the government looking at or considering regulation? What the current regulatory environment is? Um, just a bit of a, a quick overview summary of the feedback that we received on the March discussion paper that some of you uh, may have contributed to in terms of providing submissions. Um, the regulatory proposals themselves, the regulatory impact statement in terms of the costs and benefits, and the water quality benefits from the proposals and what's happening next. So in terms of um, the actual um, purpose of this presentation, is to obviously provide an overview of the proposals being considered by the government under specifically the Environmental Protection Act and to provide you with um, support if you choose to provide a submission on the RIS or not. Um, <clears throat> so the regulatory impact statement was released in September um, with submissions invited until the 3rd of November and this feedback will help inform um, the decision in terms of whether we keep going with regulation or not. Um, the RIS has been prepared by the Office of the Great Barrier Reef with technical assistance um, from a senior economist within the Department of Science, Information Technology and Innovation. And it's been prepared in accordance with the Queensland Treasury guidelines and was independently assessed against these guidelines by the Office of Best Practice Regulation within the Queensland uh, Productivity Commission. Okay, so why is the government considering regulation? Um, well, protecting the Great Barrier Reef is a priority for the Queensland and Australian government, um, and this is because the reef is a highly valued um, national and international icon. The reef receives runoff from around 400 square kilometres of coastal Queensland, with the greatest water quality risks coming from nutrients, fine sediments and pesticides from land-based activities in adjacent catchments. The regulatory proposals are in direct response to the recommendations made <clears throat> by the Water Science Task Force that provided advice to the government last year on how best to meet um, Queensland's water quality targets 
for nutrient and sediment reduction to support the health and resilience of the reef to respond to and recover from multiple pressures such as the changing climate. Um, while pesticides pose a risk to freshwater ecosystems, they are outside the scope of the regulatory package. The task force made 10 recommendations. Enhanced regulation was one of them and uh, seen as in an important component within a mix of tools to meet the reef water quality targets. Um, the task force also recommended addressing um, all key pollutant source as the problem is a cumulative impact one. However, other tools are also being looked at and enhanced regulations such as extension support, um, funding for rehabilitation projects and um, development of new innovative solutions such as water treatment systems. Uh, the recent um, science in terms of the science consensus statement also confirms that progress towards the targets um, is actually quite slow and not, spread, not widespread enough and um, we won't meet the targets in terms of the present initiatives that we're taking. Okay, so just a quick overview of the discussion paper feedback. Um, a discussion paper was released in March this year for a nine week consultation period. Um, <clears throat> we got 48 submissions. Um, the general feedback um, from the agricultural sector was uh, was mixed with an overall preference for voluntary a voluntary approach um, with incentives. There was some acknowledgement that the government is considering regulation and the current um, southern reef catchments are actually quite strongly opposed to regulation. If there is further regulation, it was agreed that all industries, not just agriculture, should be targeted. In terms of the conservation sector, they obviously support a regulatory approach <clears throat> underpinned by stronger and faster action across all uh, industries. So that's agriculture, urban and industrial sectors. Um, they'd like the immediate implementation of best management practices. And they support. They do support the delivery of these practices through BMP programs, best management practice programs. Um, urban and industrial stakeholders believe they're already heavily regulated, um, and that we should be targeting the highest polluting contributors in terms of the agricultural sector. In terms of the general public and other stakeholders. Um, they support efforts to protect the reef. They have strong views about using regulation as an additional measure. Um, but there's equally strong views against using regulation. They were supportive of using uh, locally tailored solutions. Okay, so just thought <clears throat> we touched base on the existing regulatory framework because the proposed package is looking at making amendments to the Environmental Protection Act. For agriculture, um, there's existing regulations under Chapter 4A of the Environmental Protection Act and these um, specifically refer to cane and grazing activities. So there's nutrient application standards um, that limits the amount of fertilizer that can be applied using a, a prescribed methodology. There's um, the requirement to keep records for nutrients and chemicals that are applied. We have a environmental risk management plan approach for larger operators, <clears throat> which isn't currently enforced, by the way. Um, and the regulations are limited to the wet tropics, Burdekin, and uh, Mackay, Whitsunday areas. In terms of industrial point source activities, which we're also targeting in terms of the regulatory proposals, um, these are regulated under the Environmental Protection Act. Um, <clears throat> they, um, these activities require an environmental authority before they can undertake um, their activities. Examples of these activities include um, sewage treatment, wastewater treatment, aquaculture, intensive animal industries such as poultry farming and some extractive and petroleum activities such as mining and quarrying. And when you make an application for an environmental authority, you're assessed against um, the environmental protection water policy which guides decision making related to water quality 
pollutants, which includes nutrients and sediments. Um, we are also looking at other sectors besides agriculture and um, industrial activities, such as urban development and stormwater management, and the role that they play in reef water quality. However, these proposals, um, the current proposals on the table, um, will not seek to further regulate diffuse pollution from urban development. And this is because the recently amended planning framework, which came into effect in July 2017, includes new policy to achieve best management practice for erosion, sediment and stormwater management in urban areas, including the prevention of water pollution during the construction phase of urban development. Okay, in terms of the new regulatory proposals, um, these will apply across a broader range of key industries to better address the cumulative impacts of multiple pollutant sources on, on reef water quality and this is in alignment with the task force recommendations to um, implement broader um, measures for key pollutants. Um, the four proposals on the table are setting catchment pollution loads for each reef, uh, reef catchment to target responses for managing risk to water quality, setting or improving uh, minimum practice standards for key agricultural industries, requiring fertilizer resellers to keep and produce records on request, and this is about um, nutrient application advice to help improve nutrient management outcomes, and establish a water quality offset framework, and this is to manage water quality from new development um, <clears throat> in the context of the load limits so that we're not increasing our overall load from new development. So the purpose of the regulations is to set minimum standards to bring all operators up to an acceptable baseline, and this is in alignment with the standard approach for other industries that release pollutants to the environment, and also, as I said, with water quality offset to address um, additional pollution loads from new development so that um, our current efforts aren't compromised by new development. Um, and just like to say that um, the great work of business landholders and industry in moving away from high risk practices um, is acknowledged. Um, however, the latest science does show that progress towards the targets the water quality targets for a healthy reef is, is too slow. All right, so moving on to catchment load limits. So catchment load limits applies to all sectors. Um, so we're looking to put uh, the new river basin targets that will be in the uh, reef water quality protection plan, the updated plan, um, into legislation as catchment load limits. Um, and the reason we're doing this is to provide a driver or a trigger um, for existing activities to meet minimum um, regulatory standards and then as a direct link for um, new um, industrial activities to consider these load limits when they're actually conditioned under an environmental authority. Um, and this is in relation to avoiding mitigating and offsetting significant uh, residual loads. Um, and the load limits will be updated as the targets um, are updated. Okay, so we're just moving on to existing production for agriculture. Um, so in terms of minimum standards, the minimum standards um, will apply to commercial cane, grazing, bananas, grain and horticultural producers in all catchments. Um, so they'll be, the, pract the current practices for cane will be improved. Um, there'll be new standards for grazing, bananas, grains and horticulture. The current package um, is just about cane, grazing and bananas. Horticulture and grains will be addressed at a later date in terms of the actual standards um, that will apply. Um, the standards themselves are based on reducing sediment and nutrient runoff 
um, related to the reef water quality risk management framework as well as industry standards in the BNP program. They look at practices such as um, fertiliser application, maintaining ground cover, irrigation efficiency and record keeping. Um, we're putting time frames in legislation about when those standards would start. So we'd have a revised um, standard for cane starting within 12 months of the legislation um, being approved and then within two years for um, grazing and bananas. There's also an additional, um, I suppose, a stage two for cane, which would come online within two years. Um, and then we also have review processes embedded in legislation to improve these standards over time. Okay, so the next slide is about um, recognising good performers and this is about um, supporting our existing best management practice programs that are in place. Um, so <clears throat> we're looking into or we would like to um, recognise uh, BMP programs or like programs that allow growers to meet the minimum regulatory standard. Um, so growers that are accredited under these recognised programs would be deemed as meeting the requirements, um, the standard, and they wouldn't need to do any additional additional um, measures. Um, there are voluntary programs that are already in place, um, and there's others that are being developed, um, and this includes some components of those programs, such as um, like the accreditation component. And we're developing the criteria to, um, to do that, or we will be developing that criteria. Um, the next component is about um, fertilizer resellers keeping records. So a fertilizer reseller um, is defined as a person or business that sells for commercial gain fertilizer containing nitrogen and or phosphorus to an operator of an agricultural ERA. Um, so we're looking to um, request records about uh, soil sampling and results as well as sales and advice provided um, to provide um, a second line of evidence related to um, nutrient application. So the reason why we're doing, is doing this or looking into this is that um, um, you know, producers talk to fertilizer resellers and, and get their advice and um, we'd like this advice to be aligned with um, best practice or you know the management standards that are being um, promoted. It also allows for ongoing engagement with the fertilizer industry um, towards um, you know improved stewardship. Okay, uh, regulating new development. So this is about new agricultural production. Um, so here, this is we're talking about offsets here. Um, so <clears throat> offsets are are about um, offsetting additional nutrient and sediment loads from an activity where they can't otherwise be offset through um, your management practices. And offsets are about counterbalancing um, this pollution or reducing it um, through measures taken either on site or elsewhere, such as um, putting in riparian strips or um, you know um, treatment systems, water treatment systems. So new um, production is defined as new greenfield sites or the expansion and intensification of existing activities. Um, and we're talking about uh, agriculture that hasn't been undertaken before or recently undertaken or increased fertilizer application or increased irrigation or water use. Um, the delivery of an offset will be a deemed condition which would be included in um, the um, code, the commodity specific code where the standards are and it would be delivered through something called a offset delivery arrangement which would need need to be entered into prior to undertaking the new um, production. 
Okay, so in terms of new industrial activities, it's the same concept that applies, it's just um, delivered in a slightly different way. Um, so because these activities are already regulated and they require a permit, um, the requirement for an offset would happen through an assessment process for that permit. Um, and these activities would be required to offset significant residual loads as part of their environmental authority. And again, it would be the same um, condition would be required. Okay, in terms of um, doing a water quality offset framework, we know there's a lot of interest in this, and um, the RIS just outlines a, a bit of a skeleton of how it might work. Um, we know there's a lot more work to do on the detail, um, and unfortunately we can't really speak to that detail, uh, except to say that um, <clears throat> before offsets are required, we would have to develop an offsets policy and a calculator in consultation with stakeholders, which would define what we mean by significant residual um, pollution or loads. And, um, the calculator would allow for you know, site-specific parameters to be inputted so that that load could be specific to a individual site. Um, we are looking at putting the framework under the Environmental Protection Act. Um, we know that there is the Environmental Offset Act um, and it, this is a bit of a departure from that approach. Um, the reason why we're looking at the Environmental Protection Act is that um, while the Offsets Act allows for other policies, it doesn't directly allow for the approach that we want to take with agriculture. So we think it would be um, less complex to set it up under the Environmental Protection Act. However, we obviously would use tools that are already in place um, and we would seek to complement um, other frameworks, including that Act. Um, so moving on to the regulatory impact um, assessment. Okay, just a quick overview of the um, background to the assessment. So it's been done by a senior economist within the city. Um, the costs and benefits are estimates, they are indications. They do use the best available data. However, um, the costs, you know, the figures that have used may be over or under estimations, so in some cases you may think they're too high, in other cases you may think they're too low. Um, <clears throat> it's very difficult to get perfect information um, that actually replicates every single scenario out there um, in, at the catchment scale, and there are a lot of different scenarios for agriculture, for example. So we've used the best available information that we can find, and one of, this, one of the sources of this information is from the Alluvium Consultancy Report, which is a recent report that was done um, for the Great Barrier Reef um, Task Force about how much it would cost to meet the, um, the targets. And as part of that, there were a number of different interventions that were costed, and one of them was land practice change for cane and grazing. So we're using a lot of, well, using the figures and the data from from that report for cane and grazing. For bananas, we have uh, less reliable information, so we've had to use um, you know, some peer-reviewed um, papers. And water quality offsets, um, the actual costs related to them, we've had to use, look at the reef, the reef trust calculator, for example. So there's a number of different sources of information we've used. We've also talked to some industry um, people in terms of developing there is and um, staff economists as well. Um, so in terms of the assessment, it was done over a 10-year period because the regulation, that's a general assessment period for um, a costing exercise and the regulations will come in in different periods over that time. And the costs and benefits are presented in different ways. So we have a total cost and benefit to society. Um, which just amalgamates all the costs and benefits to give you one figure for benefits and one figure for costs. And then, and then there's other costs and benefits 
that are broken down for each sector. So for example, for government, for industry, and then sectors within that agriculture, bananas, grazing. And then we do have a sector cost that go down to um, a regional scale with an average sort of farm size, which includes per hectare estimates, for example, for minimum standards. Um, okay. So in terms of the sugarcane costs for minimum standards, cost and benefit, so there are large one-off estimated costs. Um, and this depends, obviously depends on the region. So these costs and benefits are, you know, straight out of the RIS, obviously. Um, and you can see the range there. And there are um, there are savings as well. So in terms of of um, cane growers, there's 3,007 cane growers across the reef catchments. Um, the total one-off capital cost for the sector is 142 million and 14 million per annum um, as an ongoing cost. And this is for implementing the nutrient management, the finer scale nutrient management approach. Um, but there's also a return on investment of 54 million per year in estimated profits. And the profit range is between 7,844 in the Burdekin, 9,000 in the Rep Tropics, 44,000 in Mackay with Sundays, and 49,000 in the Burnett Mary. Um, <clears throat> so we acknowledge that um, there are obviously upfront costs in terms of implementing um, the management practices um, and we are looking into support packages related to this based on the highly successful Burdekin uh, farm trial for improved nutrient use efficiency and profitability. And this is where growers aren't otherwise engaged in incentive programs. Um, there will be some additional costs associated with the proposed farm design standards for new sugarcane production, but these are expected to be quite low. And this is because we expect that those sorts of practices would be covered by other regulations, um, such as um, clearing native vegetation requirements, um, the requirements for protecting wetlands, for example. And that if people are starting a new business, they would probably be seeking to use the latest um, best management practices and technologies from an, from an economic, um, financial, profitability perspective. Okay, in terms of the grazing sector, um, again, this is just a high-level snapshot of the, of the costs and benefits that are in the RIS. Um, so there's approximately 8,500 graziers in the reef catchment. Um, we, we acknowledge that there is a large one-off capital cost for the across the sector of 148 million with ongoing costs estimated at um, 32 million per year. And these costs are high due to the large area of land subject to grazing. Um, we do, however, um, assume that um, there'll be increased profitability from these improved um, practices in terms of land condition, which is generally seen to be in the long term in the RIS of greater than 15 years. However, there are studies that show a return on investment um, within five to 10 years. Um, in terms of the, the cost calculations, they're based on the value of stock removed to reduce grazing pressure. Um, and there is strong evidence from a number of different um, studies that doing this does improve ground cover water quality and does have long-term profitability and sustainability outcomes. However, um, because of the low historical low margins in the grazing sector, um, this um, is probably a disincentive to using these sorts of practices. Um, we are investigating support packages for graziers in relation to these costs. And um, to give you a better idea of the costs, um, at a per hectare scale, they range from about $5 to $27, depending on the catchment.
Okay. Okay, the banana sector. Um, there's less economic analysis, as I've said, for the banana sector on best management practice programs. Um, those estimates aren't actually um, as readily available as they are for cane and grazing. Um, but we, we would expect that um, um, using um, the management practices that are proposed for fertiliser application, for example, would produce a, a net financial benefit. Okay, so in terms of the costs for the water quality offset for the agricultural sector, um, <clears throat> So these are based on estimating the cumulative area of the expansion each year over the 10-year assessment period, um, the associated amount of residual nutrient and sediment load on a per tonne per hectare basis as an average um, for cane and grazing operating at bee practice, and the cost per tonne of averting um, nutrients and sediments from the offset. So um, in terms of the actual area of expansion, this is actually quite low. So we're not expecting offsets to be um, a big requirement or a big impost. Um, in terms of the area of expansion for cane, it's estimated that it'll be about 1% in the area per year. And for grazing, about 0.1%. Um, for horticulture, it's also about 0.1%. Um, so that relates to bananas. Um, in terms of um, the actual offset, uh, sorry, the load itself, um, this will be determined, like the significant residual load will be determined by be determined by the calculator. But we have actually tried to get an estimate of the load for the costings exercise. And again, this is a, a sort of an average for cane and grazing. Um, and that load was the export load. Um, so the actual load that goes into the reef rather than the inputs that go onto the farm, for example, from fertilizer. Um, and in terms of the cost per ton, um, the most of that, like the most um, recent information, um, has come from the Reef Trust calculator. Um, the uh, cost is quite high, but this is the only reliable information that we have at the moment in terms of the cost after a B level practice is met, um, and it, it ranges between 150,000 to 232,000 for um, nutrients and it's actually quite less for sediments which is about $230. Um, so in terms of the offsets you can see the um, sector costs. So for cane it's up to six million per year and for grazing it's about one million per year. Um, again we're not expecting um, there to be a lot of offsets because of the low predicted increase in the production area for cane grazing as well as bananas. Um, and the cost is probably an overestimate because we haven't um, factored in the farm design requirement. And um, we also have to remember that offsets can be a driver um, for innovation in terms of avoiding offsets to um, you know, look at other ways of minimising um, nutrient and sediment releases. In terms of industrial activities, um, so the costs and benefits for this were limited to sewage treatment operators. And this is because we don't expect to see a significant increase in um, other industrial activities in the reef catchments over the 10 year assessment period in terms of those activities that release nutrients and sediments to land and waters. Um, so the estimated cost is about two million per year based on a 1% population increase where the sewage treatment is using best practice um, um, activities. 
And again, the cost is based on an additional load per year. And this is generated by in increased population growth. And then the abatement costs per tonne. Um, and again, using the Reef Trust calculator, cost of um, the maximum cost um, for nutrient at you know, $232,000. Okay, so that's all the costs and benefits, financial benefits in terms of return on investment from a, a profitability perspective. In terms of the actual water quality benefits to the reef and why um, we think this um, helps achieve the targets and is a good idea, these are the range of um, benefits across the catchments in relation to nutrient and sediment reduction. So you can see that um, there's a range between 13% um, and 48% um, for nutrients and the range for sediments is between 12 and 36% in terms of uh, moving towards the targets. And in terms of um, load abatement, um, that's outlined in the RIS. But it's a, it's 180 uh, sorry 1,852 tons for averted nutrients from min, uh, minimum practice standards for sugarcane. It's about 1 million tons of averted sediment from grazing. It's about 185 tons of averted nutrients and 25,000 tons of averted sediment from offsets for cane and 26,000 tonnes of averted sediments for offsets from grazing and about 70 tonnes of averted nutrients um, from offsets for sewage treatment plants. Um, and you'll notice that we, that, um, we haven't been able to um, monetize the water quality benefits in the RIS, so there is a gap between the quantified costs and benefits. Um, in the RIS, which is about 400, 450 million in net present value, but we consider this to be a small proportion in relation to the overall value of the reef, which has recently been valued at 56 billion in terms of its, um, its values to the community as a whole. In terms of the next steps from here, um, so submissions close on the regulatory impact statement on the 3rd of November, which is two weeks from tomorrow. Um, we'll analyse the submissions that have been received and um, the analysis of this will be um, put into a decision RIS um, and the decision RIS um, also talks about changes to proposals based on feedback that's received and, um, and other, other things and that'll be provided publicly um, when it's completed and been approved by um, Cabinet. Uh, if we go forward with regulatory changes, um, a bill will be introduced into Parliament um, next year and we'll also have to do the supporting regulations and the supporting regulations are just about the detail. So right now we have the, um, the architecture and the framework and that would go into the Environmental Protection Act but the detail of how that, how that works, like the standards themselves, would have to go into regulations that sit under that act. And then from July 2018 we'd have staged implementation across industry sectors and this would begin with cane and then um, follow with grazing and bananas, again if this is all passed by, by Parliament. Um, and that's it in terms of the webinar presentation. So um, we'll take questions now and before we take questions just um, let you know that we have a few people in the room. I'll just wait till we're unmuted, so you can, uh, so they can introduce themselves. Okay, 
Um, so the people in the room are um, colleagues from the Office of the Great Barrier Reef and I'll just let them go around the room and um, introduce themselves. Yeah, hi, Chris Johnson here from the Office of the Great Barrier Reef. Hi, it's Louise Mice here. I'm Director for Reef Policy in the Office. Uh, Scott Robinson, Director of Reef Programs within the IGBL. Okay, so um, everybody's here to help answer questions. So we've received two questions. So that one question is how many recognised BMP programs are there currently? Right. Yes. So at the moment the BM, there are um, BMP programs um, but they're not formally recognised in terms of what we're proposing to do. So these programs um, were set up um, in response or under the previous LNP government. Um, under, that, under that government uh, they chose not to um, directly enforce the regulations, so meaning they decided to switch them off and um, support the MP programs instead um, for cane and grazing. Um, so we have those programs that are up and running. Um, under the, the regulatory proposals, what we're proposing to do is to continue to support those programs by um, recognising them where they can provide the ability for growers to meet our minimum standards. Um, so in order for, for us to do that, we have to develop that recognition criteria. We expect that the existing programs would pretty much meet that criteria straight away. Um, there may be some tweaks, obviously, to that. Um, but we're also opening it up to other programs that want to do want to do that as well. So it's um, open to to any program that wants to support um, producers to meet the regulatory uh, requirements. Did you want to add anything to that? Is anyone in the room? No. Okay. So the next question is, how are the water quality benefits modelled and what are the model inputs other than reduced nutrient application? What impacts are included in the model related to farm practice improvement? Okay, so at a, at a really high level, and we might have to get back to you with some more detail, the water quality benefits have been modelled through the Alluvium um, Costings Report. So under the Alluvium Report, they did the cost, cost and financial benefits and water quality benefits for cane and grazing um, in terms of moving from um, a D-class practice to a C-class practice a C class practice to a B class practice, for example. Um, so we've used those modelled results for our um, proposed standards because our proposed standards are seeking to shift growers from a C class practice to a B class practice over time. So those benefits that have been modelled in the Alluvium report are directly related to the management practices. In terms of the benefits, for offsets, we haven't the water quality benefits for offsets. We haven't been able to directly in, include them in the RIS, so we'll have additional benefits from offsets that haven't been accounted for. Um, and the farm practice improvement, I'm interpreting, um, is about the farm design for new agriculture, and again, we haven't been able to factor factor that improvement in but we don't think it, it would be substantial. Okay, the next question is about irrigation application efficiency. Um, how will this be measured and what will be the minimum standards required?
sorry for the delay. <laughs> Getting back to you on the last question. Um, we don't actually have any proposed standards related to irrigation application efficiency at this present time. However, you know, there is, is a consultation document, so you know, if if you think that this should be part of this particular regulatory response, um, then by all means put that in a submission. Um, so the next question is about soil testing for resellers. Will these soil testers test be GPS referenced? Um, it's Chris here. Um, at this point we're not um, proposing to make that a, a minimum requirement, although it can form part of the soil testing regime. Um, but we are still, um, the minimum standards are still under development and we can certainly consider um, yeah, changes to those to those proposed minimum requirements to soil testing. Okay, the next question is how is the progress to the nutrient catchment load measured? Okay, so that's, um, that question is about um, our paddock to reef monitoring and modelling program that's been in operation for about nine years now and um, it's used to monitor and model end of catchment uh, load related to land use practices, the dominant land use practices that release, release these loads which is uh, mainly sugarcane and grazing, however horticulture is captured bananas is captured and um, industrial activities and urban development is also captured. And uh, we, we report on this regularly through the reef report cards. Okay, so the next question is there's 286 tonnes of DIN reduction flagged for the Burdekin by 2025. How does that relate to product that's supplied? Yeah, I'll take that one to Chris. Um, short answer is um, it doesn't, or we don't know. Uh, but the the model that model reduction of 286 tonnes um, was done under the Elysium report, but the the regulations, um, the proposed minimum standards, uh, will have an impact on on product supplies, and it's proposed under the chain standards that that you know continues to uh, in the initial phases align with the uh, existing regulatory requirements, which are based on six easy steps. And then moving uh, in two years to a nutrient management planning approach, uh, which you know our intention is that may refine uh, nutrient application, but there's no um, uh, detail around the nutrient management plan in, in the sense that you know it will require X amount of um, fertilizer to be applied. So um, yeah, we're still working out I guess the detail around the nutrient management plan. Um, Requirement which will come in under stage two of the minimum standard. The geographical variability makes, and the differences in practices makes that a very difficult thing to determine. That that relationship between loss versus what's um, applied. Okay, the next question is: What is the expectation for resellers if a cash customer walks off? the street and buys 10 tonnes of fertiliser, will the reseller be expected to capture details of the customer? Possibly. Um, did, yeah, so Scott said possibly, so um, you know, we're refining or I suppose looking into those record keeping requirements and getting feedback from um, resellers about how they do transactions, so that feedback will, you know, help refine our approach. 
Okay, the next, the next question is, fertilizer resellers often only sell fertilizer to farmers who have had soil testing carried out by independent agronomists. They have no record of or control over where that fertilizer is applied. How are these records of fertilizer sales to be linked to farmers, blocks, or even different legal entities? Okay, so the intention of um, record keeping for fertilizer resellers is to provide a second line of evidence um, around um, the advice that was provided and the product that was sold to a particular client. Um, the onus is on, on the producer, the grower, to meet the regulatory requirements. So there's no actual direct link between what was applied and what was sold because we do understand that there's multiple parties that can sell fertilizer to growers. This is um, just to support us in terms of uh, our compliance response around um, gathering um, um, additional information where we think that um, there might be over application of fertilizer going on. Um, there is no, I suppose, repercussions for um, bad advice um, or how much is sold. Um, it's the repercussions for fertilizer resellers is about not providing the records. Does anybody want to add to that? That there's no additional questions. Does anybody have any additional other additional questions? Oh, there's four coming. Oh, four minutes left. There's four minutes left. <laughs> Okay, we've just received another question um, in terms of assistance packages. The question is, the availability of extension resources is a constraint. Has this been taken into account in determining timelines for changes to minimum standards? Um, so in terms of the time frames, um, the immediate time frame is for Kane in terms of revised standards and those revised standards we're seeing as um, pretty minimal really and that's why they'll switch on straight away. Um, in terms of the, the nutrient management planning approach at a refined scale, um, we consider it two years to be um, an adequate amount of time to um, to implement those um, requirements. Um, however, we do acknowledge that um, there will um, that there will be support that's required um, in terms of agronomic support. So we are looking into how we might provide that support. Um, in terms of grazing and bananas, 
um, because we haven't had minimum standards that apply across the board before, we're providing, we're providing extra time for this. However, the, the standards that will need to be um, implemented will be available um, up front, so people will know what they need to do um, and be given two years to do that. Um, again, we acknowledge that you know um, costs and extension support um, for those practices, um, you know, could be um, required on quite a large scale. So we are looking into um, what support we can provide in those areas. We've also attempted in creating the minimum standards to deliberately target practices that are. Um, um, a, a generally accepted industry standard and that are the practices that the industry largely view as outdated. Um, so we're, we're expecting that, that the bar that we've set um, for a lot of growers shouldn't be a difficult um, hurdle to get over without that agronomic advice. And there are also incentive programs that are out there as well. Um, so in terms of those programs we'd, we'd be seeking to complement them. We just clarified too that for the Burnett Mary, so those areas where we haven't had standards in place before, they will have additional time to um, transition to the new uh, minimum standards. Any, any other response? Um, it's one o'clock. Um, does anybody have any further questions that they'd like to ask or any points of clarification in terms of the responses we've provided so far on the questions you've asked? Okay, we'll wait. We'll wait another minute, and then we'll um, we'll uh, finish off. Yeah. All right, we might, we might, oh, here's one. The last minute scraped in. Um, if we can't lower our DIN levels with six easy steps, will we have to go to lower, and I presume that means uh, lower standards, or does it mean lower? Yeah. Lower. Probably. Lower fertilizer rates. Okay. Sure. Um, so that's the that's really the intent behind the a nutrient management plan process to find the opportunity where there are opportunities on farm to optimise um, fertiliser application and process and practices um, that might further enhance um, nutrient management beyond the six easy steps, um, particularly the six easy steps district yield potential stage. All right, we might wrap it up there. Um, thanks for everybody who's um, participated in the webinar and um, if you do have any additional questions um, you know you're welcome to send them through to um, the office of the GBR um, email address which can we put that slide up Kevin? Don't worry. Oh, okay um, so the address is in front of you so please if you have any additional questions please let us know and um, we'll respond to those questions. I hope this has been a useful exercise for you and just a reminder that um, submissions 
are um, invited on the resin for the 3rd of November. Okay, thank you.